This conference will now be recorded. Thanks. I call the meeting to order. We have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, so uh, well, let's go ahead and start by looking at the meeting summary from our last meeting. Um, I did read through it. I didn't see anything myself that really stood out as something we needed to fix. But if anybody else has any amendments to the meeting summary from our last meeting, please uh, feel free to speak up. Good. I'll just say four minutes, <laughs> which we'll leave. So uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, COVID relief funding recommendations, which uh, Ron, you can go ahead and start bringing those up if you would. So basically, uh, the idea is that most of these are, are just generally good recommendations, but, but one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to get them out there sooner to RTD than waiting until the end of the year or, or, uh, or rather the middle of the year, July, June, July. And because some of them are really relevant to issues I know RTD cares a lot about, like ridership and, uh, and like uh, some of the sensitivities that some of the districts are feeling about services and how we might be able to bump that up some. So that's just a real brief uh, intro. But what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to go ahead and get a motion to, uh, to recommend that those, let me just summarize it. We'll make the motion to to recommend these to the accountability committee, and then we will go into the discussion period after the motion has been made. But remember, when we're through going through all of these amendments and, and commenting and amending if we need to or whatever else, then we will vote on them at the end of that. So, um, Ron, could you put up what that proposed motion is and maybe I can get someone to make it. So there's the proposed motion. Move to recommend the RTD Accountability Committee adopt recommendations to RTD for use of COVID-19 relief funds appropriated to RTD in the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021. So moved. The intent is we're not going to use all of it, <laughs> but a portion of it, right? Elise? So moved. Second? Second. Good. All right, let's move on with the discussion then. Okay, so by this time, I'm sure you all have carefully poured over all of this. So let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and jump into the specific recommendations. Uh, there's a prelude to this also on, on this, uh, but the recommendations uh, start with number one here, which is provide a tra transparent process and make priorities clear. So Rebecca, you're the one that uh, came up with this one. I'd like for you to go ahead and speak to it if you would. Sure, Brett, thank you. Um, this is a, a topic I think we've discussed at a couple different junctures, um, and I just thought it would be a good kind of overarching recommendation to RTD um, to just make sure that they have a, a pretty open process for sharing the priorities for using these dollars, and then ultimately the allocation and um, expenditure of them. So I think the text there is uh, pretty, um, Pretty self uh, self explaining, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions from the committee on the intent here. And part of this comes out of the fact that we had this problem with the legislature and the governor uh, seeing all this money come in from the federal government and not feeling like 
it necessarily was spent in in all the appropriate ways. And we did a review of the uh, 2020 funding, and the conclusion of our committee was that it was uh, used uh, appropriately. Um, I would, the, the, one of the big concerns we did say at the end of our report, though, is that use of CARES Act funds was not transparent or easily understandable. And uh, that is, to some degree, the stimulus for having this recommendation to RTD. And it seems quite reasonable to me. But if anyone uh, would like to comment on it, I would encourage you to do so. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, looks good to me. I would I would add I don't know if we're going to talk about this at some point, but um, General Manager, Manager Johnson did report last night at the RTD meeting how they are planning on spending the CRISA funds, mm -hmm. and they've left about 13 million dollars um, for our recommendations and the state auditor any actions taken in response to the state audit. So I just wanted to put that in context as we go through this. Terrific, it's good to hear. And, and I see General Manager Johnson's on the on the line, so. And, and we always welcome your presence at this committee mm -hmm. and appreciate you taking the time to do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I I think what we should do is keep moving through these and see if there's some that we have a, any specific problems with. So um, I think this uh, uh, recalling previously laid off line employees. Um, Lynn, I don't know if that came out of your discussions uh, with the lease or uh, specifically where it came from, but it, you know, it's obvious, it seems kind of obvious that that's a big part uh, and a big part of why that those funds were allocated uh, anyway. Yeah, I think uh, uh, General Manager Johnson could speak to this, but I'm pretty sure they're all back or on their way back, the, the frontline workers, including um, most of the part-timers. Mm -hmm. Um, CEO Johnson, uh, could you uh, speak to this uh, particularly? We di we didn't really know how many of those people might have gone off and gotten other jobs and things like that in the interim while they were off. Do we have a feel for that yet? Yes. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to address this matter before all of you. So as it relates to our recall process, we have uh, completed the full-time recall process. And where we stand right now is we just commenced as of Monday, the recall process with the part-time operators. When we speak to the operators being part-time, uh, there are 137. So we're in the, we're just in the, in the midst of doing that as we just, uh, reached uh, some determination about how that would occur. So we anticipate having the complement of part-time employees contingent upon adhering to drug and alcohol testing and their acknowledgement pursuant to the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, they have up to 15 days in which to respond to us. So uh, this process is underway and uh, will take a couple of weeks. Um, but we are full steam ahead and this quite naturally falls into the roll-up of our service delivery model as we look to uh, supplement uh, services to uh, accommodate for increased loads and things of the like. Thank you. Very good, thank you. So uh, if we if we have any further discussion of this, if anybody would like to say anything, uh, please speak up. Otherwise, we'll move on to recommendation number three. Hey, Rod. Yes. Is it just to make sure I caught that. So these were just the part-time operators. Were full-time operators brought back as well? If I may, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, for clarification purposes, when we talk about frontline, it's our complement of operations employees that encompass mechanics as well, light rail mechanics, so forth. As it relates to our collective bargaining agreement, we first have to call back full-time employees, which was done and that was completed. And we recently commenced with part-time effective Monday, February 1st. 
Very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for that clarification. If there's nothing else, we'll move on to uh, recommendation number three, share federal stimulus funding with other transit service providers in the metro area. There are several nonprofit and community-based transit service providers in the RTD district. They supplement RTD's fixed route and paratransit services, often at a lower cost than RTD could provide comparable service. As with RTD, these providers have been impacted by reduced ridership and revenues due to the COVID-19 pandemic and will benefit from CRISA funding. So Elise, you wanna to speak to this one? Um. It's a recognition that there that all of the transit service providers um, in the metro area are critical for mobility, and the CRISA Act specifically calls out that some of this funding is is designed to help um, keep them afloat as well. And this this will will um, keep keep those providers um, financially solvent and continue to um, you know provide the the mobility to the metro area transit riders. So, and it's my understanding that RTD is um, planning on doing this, um, doing some sharing, although I'll defer to General Manager Johnson on that. If you, oh. if you would. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to step on your toes with uh, parliamentary procedure. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, so yes. Um, uh, uh, Chair Elise, Co-Chair Elise Jones was correct in, in relationship to what we anticipate doing as we look at our services holistically. This is our complete roll up as we look at service delivery, recognizing that RTD uh, partners with other entities. So as we go through our assessment and deem what we need in relationship to allocating services, that is very much included in those overarching dollars um, that was referenced early on. Um, by co-chair uh, Jones. So we're open to it, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> we, we're not asking for commitments today. These are recommendations. I'm sure the board will have something to say. <laughs> so any other comments from uh, the committee members or concerns about that one? Okay, we'll move on to four. Implement a reduced flat fare for six months to rebuild ridership and attract new riders. Market it as a simple, affordable, and easy to understand way to ride RTD and an incentive to attract returning and new riders. Offer half off fare for seniors, people with disabilities, as necessary to comply with FTA requirements and consider extending the half off fares for youth riders. This will reduce costs for financially struggling essential workers who are still riding RTD. During the pilot program, use this time to explore other ways to improve affordability of existing and or new pass programs, including the LIBE Live that can be put in place as a longer term solution. So who would like to speak to this particular one? I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think that one of our overriding concerns as a committee is how do we increase ridership, um, in particular to recover from the COVID um, reduction that has been seen, but also to attract new riders to the system overall. Um, we also have a overriding concern about equity and this um, proposal would encourage RTD to be innovative and try out a significant fare reduction reduction in recognition that RTD fares are pretty high. Um, that would help immediately attract people back to the system um, and, and um, boost the ridership, hopefully um, induce people to look at transit that they that you know might have stopped riding or never have ridden before because it's 
you know, a financially viable way for them to uh, go to work or what have you. And it would also um, help folks that are still uh, dealing with financial in, the financial impacts of COVID. So that's and, the impetus for that. And I, I would observe that uh, the comment about RTD's fares being relatively high is data-based by looking at other other uh, transit agencies. Um, our, in spite of that, our fare box ratios are still pretty are are very low. Uh, but um, COVID is certainly a big part of that. But they were they were low around the 20% level even before COVID hit. So, I would just note that yeah. six months was used in here because that's the the length of time before you have to do a um, the required sort of equity analysis. So it, it would give you enough time to pilot something, collect some data, but um, wouldn't re impose the the equity analysis that's um, required. I would also mention there that we do. An equity analysis, and we'll we'll have that as some, one of the things we'll append to these uh, as part of uh, as part of every recommendation that we make. Right. Yes, Lynn. That's right. Uh, I've talked a little bit with uh, General Manager Johnson, but but not much yet. But um, I think this is fine. Um, although I I think there are several issues to be worked out. Um, I love the idea of trying to lower our fares, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm just giving you my thoughts here um, as some potential feedback and, and Ms. Johnson, I think is going to speak as well. I'm not sure if flat fare is quite the right answer. We have people coming in from the airport. So, um, you know, and, and that you know, would certainly be an to, to look at some different fares. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, there's a question about the perfect timing for this because we want to help essential workers at the same time we want to bring people back. And we're not sure quite, you know, with the vaccines the way they are, what that will look like. Um, uh, and then how long, and, you know, the six months is because we have to do an equity analysis. I, for one, would love to see us be able to do something longer um, in the sense that, you know, we are bringing things back over a period. And as you said, our fares are, are fairly high right now. So those are my my thoughts. Um, one. Uh, one comment on that, I think in many of these recommendations and discussions, it's kind of assumed, I think, by most of us that the airport line, the A line, is kind of a different animal. Um, certainly people coming in on flights, I don't think they, they feel like $10 roughly is is an unreasonable, especially for the tourist, fee to, to uh, come back in on it. And so uh, uh, A line, I would just say that A-line, of course, uh, these are recommendations. We won't be surprised if you handle that differently. Uh, CEO Johnson. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to just provide uh, a little more uh, context in the effort to manage expectations. I wanna preface my comments by saying that um, I, as well as my team are open to evaluating what might be the most prudent course of action, because as you know, I do too agree that our fares are expensive in comparison. More so, you made a comment, uh, Chairman Rudd, as it relates to um, the, um, oh my God, I just, oh, fare box recovery. One thing I do wanna recognize as well, that our fare box recovery ratio, where I was written in Statio, is not the norm for the transit industry as well. So when we use those two together, it's a holistic viewpoint that we need to take when we talk about the fares and the fare box recovery ratio, because for all intents and purposes, other transit, other transit agencies don't use their subsidies. But with that as a backdrop, not only are we talking about the A-line, we have to keep in mind that we have other um, uh, premium yeah. services holistically. So while we talk about a flat fare, there may be a flat fare in which we need to do some recognizance on relative to those services. So for instance, when you're looking at an over the road coach that basically goes on the freeway, for instance, like the flat iron flyer, and you compare it to a standard um, 40 foot bus that's riding down a city street, those aren't comparable services. So they shouldn't have the same fare when you're thinking about the distance in which that bus is traversing, you know, 20 miles versus an average of a three to four mile, um, four mile trip as well. So more so what my team and I intend to do is look at it and evaluate 
to make an informed decision about what the optimal fare could be. So I wanted to share that. And, and I know that Director Geisinger said that, you know, uh, she would hope that we could do longer than six months just for everyone's context, recognizing that the fair equity analysis that we talk about comes out of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And in doing so, the Federal Transit Administration prescribes that it's six months. If we wanted to do something more than that, we have to appeal to the FTA to be allowed to extend that period of time and justify why we think there is a need in which to do so. So I just wanted to share that for everybody's edification purposes. And as we look at this holistically, we are open to talk and discuss about what might be feasible. Of course, we have a, a clear cut interest in having a um, resurgence in the three R's of reclaiming, retaining, and uh, you know, uh, recruiting customers. That's first and foremost, but wanna do it in the sense of having a growth ridership action plan where there are different tactics that we utilize that gets, that can sustain that ridership as we go forward. So thank you very much. I'd, I'd also mention that the legislation that is being considered, will be considered uh, this, this session, <clears throat> will put more of a focus on ridership and less of a focus on, on fare box ratio recoveries. You've got a business to run, and I'm sure you're, you're going to do uh, whatever you can to make sure that it's going to continue to be solvent. But uh, from the larger perspective of the Metro Denver area, it's ridership that really is a key, a key value. You know, the more cars we take off the road, uh, the you know the better it is for uh, the ones that are left there, and also the better it is for our air quality issues as well. The other thing that uh, that Elise mentioned in this is, is the simplification of the fares. And we've seen some other studies, and I'm sure you've, you've seen this and are, are aware of it too, uh, CEO Johnson, that, uh, that complex fares tend to, to drive people away. And ways of finding that you can simplify whatever those fare structures are, they really have a, have a great advantage in, in, in some of the uh, transit agencies have found that their income actually increased when they simplified their fares, even if it meant lowering those fares. So that's part of the part of uh, the point of this one as well. So, uh, any further discussion? Any committee? I, Brad, to? I appreciate you making that point. I, I was going to say that that was one of the reasons a flat um, fare was proposed was just simplify make it super easy and attractive, get people back on the uh, on the bus and the train, and then hopefully we can keep them there. Um, but we're gonna have to get over this sort of COVID hump. And I can see, I think to, to um, Lynn's point, ideally we will, we could address RTD's high fares long-term. I think there's probably two pieces of it. I think there's a COVID recovery sort of pulse that we need to, to look at. Um, and we might need to do some data collection around, um, you know, what it takes to get people back. And um, so number four was really aimed at trying to be a little bit innovative with the CRISA money to try something to really sort of jolt the system back to we're open and attract writers. Um, and even as you're looking at sort of long-term solutions. Dan, I saw your hand up too. Uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I did have a question for uh, General Manager Johnson uh, about uh, capacity to accommodate uh, additional ridership. As you know, we're all operating under these COVID-19 seating restrictions, which currently in our state are 50% of seated capacity on vehicles. And I'm just wondering, during your peak periods, are you finding you have uh, are you filling the seats that are available? Are you having to provide backup service? And at what point, if we are trying to incentivize ridership, does it become kind of a problem for you in terms of having the equipment and the personnel to meet that increased demand? Thank you so much for that question. It's a very good one and I appreciate it. So a couple of things as it relates to uh, our current loads recognizing that we are adhering to the protocols established by CD, the CDC um, 
I, I've spoken about this before relative to our standard uh, 40 foot bus allowing only 15 on that vehicle, 20 on the articulated that's 60 feet in length. And then on rail cars, we're talking about 30. So while we're in the midst of the pandemic, we have to keep in mind that we have this responsibility to ensure that we're providing a health and safety, safe, safe environment for people when they are utilizing the system. So what we're doing is leveraging additional um, vehicles to supplement that so we're not leaving someone at a stop. So we have measures in place. And so those are some of the initial monies that we are leveraging as we look to utilize the Carissa funding in and of itself. So as we go forward, that is something that is of concern to me and I've spoken internally with my team about because we could be a victim of our own success. Here we put forward you know, this fair and entice people to wanna to leverage the system and we may not have adequate resources readily available. We may not have enough of the buses prime and ready to go that meets the element of state of good repair to deploy. So another aspect when we're enticing people to ride Perhaps there is another program that we leverage when we have more capacity and off peak periods. Perhaps there's more capacity readily available on a Saturday and Sunday, and we can do a partnership to entice people to come into key areas of a certain jurisdiction that have activities going on. So all of these things need to be taken into under advisement as we go forward. I'm not readily available um, at this time to give you those numbers because it's something that we're monitoring, utilizing our um, automatic passenger counters on board, supervisory um, observations, having operators call on the disc Dispatch. And what we're doing is looking at that data and trying to see where we do need to supplement service on those routes. So this is an evergreen, evergreen process. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you a direct response, but as we look at uh, bringing back um, employees and then basically doing some tweaking and alignment, uh, perhaps what that means is that we could shorten the headways on some of the routes that do have a heavier load that basically uh, translates into more revenue service hours and that also means additional operators and additional vehicles and so all of that comes into play so i will keep you all updated as we go through this you know iterative process so thank you ceo johnson i was also curious uh about the the percentage of riders that we wind up being able to get on our buses and trains uh it seems like it's more like 15 percent of the total capacity of, of some of those vehicles. And, uh, and CDPHE's recommendation was, was a limit of 50%, but you know it, it also has to do with the six foot spacing and things like that, social distancing. But um, I, I was surprised it was as low as it was. It, it, and, and so I wonder if part of the solution to that is, is having a look at whether there's any way to get more than 15 people on, you know, on a bus. I, I, I just, I just throw that out. I, I don't think, um, I don't expect an, a, uh, a response, but I did find, Dan, are you running closer to 50% uh, on your buses on Roaring Fork? Oh, um, 18 on our bus. I'm sorry, I can't, you're, you're not coming through. Um, can you hear me you now? Can... Yep. Okay. Uh, we allow 18 people on our uh, our 40 foot low floor buses that have 36 seats. We're allowing 24 people on our over the road coaches that have approximately 50 seats. Um, and uh, that seems to be working well for us currently because we are providing a very high level of service, scheduled service right now. And then we have uh, extensive backup buses deployed around our 70 mile region uh, to jump in when uh, we hit those limits on our buses. But it, it's very challenging and we have frequent dialogue with Colorado Department of Public Health in the environment uh, and the environment to see if we can increase or at least have maybe some local flexibility depending upon what's going on as far as the spread of COVID in our region to increase that number um, as we see fit in consultation with local health departments and public health officials 
But right now that 50% capacity is, is the law of the land in Colorado. Right. And I, I just wanted to add in, um, for me personally, as it relates to the space, health and safety is paramount. And I can tell you that I actually went out on a 40 foot bus with a tape measure and measured out the six feet. And that's how the 15 was derived previously. And there's been conversations within the transit industry as we talk about what is it that we should do to minimize the angst and help uh, deter the possibility of a transit vehicle becoming a super spreader. Um, and I, I, I appreciate Mr. Blankenship's comments as it relates to that. I do think as we look at what we're doing in the areas in which we're serving, that there needs to be some flexibility with that. While there could be 50% holistically, you we want to minimize individuals sitting closely together unless they come on together, they're within the same household. So um, I, I, I think if anything, there's flexibility and agility. And as we get to a point um, whereby we see numbers decreasing and the vaccinations become more prevalent, um, we're willing to look at those look at those numbers as well. But at this juncture, like 50% capacity on a standard bus, I have to tell you from my perspective, I don't feel comfortable with that where we are collectively uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Brent, I think it's important to, I think it was Lynn that mentioned that the timing of this um, is something to think about because it, it would take a, a little bit of time to stand up a, a, a reduced fare program anyway, um, right. that you might have it coincide for the sweet spot when, you know, there's a certain uh, uh, penetration of vaccinations that we're moving to a whole nother level and people are starting to commute back to work at a higher level. You sort of want to catch the wave and expand it and make sure that as people are, are starting to drive more, they actually choose transit. And so I think I think we could think about what the, or RTD can think about what the optimal time. And we might want to. Um, around trying to boost ridership is. And so maybe it's not, you know, in the next month, maybe it's in two months or three months. So. Uh, excuse me for yeah, go ahead. jumping in there, Rhett, but. Uh, we are, you know, doing everything that we can to advocate uh, on behalf of our frontline employees that they be bumped up as far as possible in terms of the priority for vaccinations. As we start to have more contact with the public and people are coming back to transit and so forth, and given how long it may take to get a you know, significant portion of the population vaccinated, I think that um, you ought to factor that into this discussion about trying to increase ridership to make sure that those frontline employees are protected. Um, you know, that raises a whole other question about whether or not vaccinations ought to be mandatory for people or, you know, people have the option to do it. But, but certainly, uh, the more people that work for us that can be vaccinated, uh, the more reliable our service is going to be, the more protected our workers are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That ought to be a consideration, too. And I'm sure that's that is that is a consideration. I, I, I it seems like that they were considered to be essential workers. Uh, people that drive buses under the current uh, restrictions. Do we know? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Essential workers, I think, are 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 one B category. Or yeah, like. there 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 are a, a number of different categories, and uh, you know, right now we're looking at maybe sometime in March before our people can be vaccinated, right. um, best case scenario. Okay. All right, well, we got a big agenda. Uh, let's uh, let's keep moving. Um, so where are we now? Are we on six or five? Five, I five. think. So uh, work to improve uptake <clears throat> and ease of use of passes. Allow flexibility in the EcoPass program and contracts so that more neighborhoods and businesses can participate. For example, allow master EcoPass contracts to support county wide affordable housing programs and create more options for businesses to obtain employee EcoPasses for a subset of their workers. Help fund peak eligibility technician slash caseworkers at county 
health and human services departments to help people through live enrollment, continuing to get live ID cards and qualified participants' hands is essential and counties can provide this customer assistance but need funding to help support this function. Okay, who would like to speak to this one? Well, I just want to say that um, it dovetails with the work that the operations committee has been doing around passes um, and recognition that um, there it, it's the live pass is a difficult um, pass to get in terms of enrollment and eligibility and um, that we really need to sort of think about how we can support the, the folks that are signing people up and make it easier and also recognition that that um, we've heard from businesses and nonprofits that want more flexibility in being able to provide eco passes which we know um, increase ridership significantly and if you have an eco pass in your pocket you're more, much more likely to use transit so that's what this right. um, is aimed at good Dad, do you do you have any comments on on that one? Uh, hopefully, it's something that we're among the subcommittees. Uh, we'll we'll always be looking for things where we could be mutually supportive. Yeah, I, just, there. I was wondering if I could just get clarification on the help fund peak eligibility technicians and caseworkers. I guess I'm I'm not too clear. Is it that we are requesting the RTD help fund them, or can you talk a little bit more about that, Elise? Um, if there are funds available, that would be, there's sort of an intersection between human services and transit. And right now, the, the enrollment for the uh, live passes is really happening through HHS caseworkers in a county by county, and they are limited, there's limited capacity. So unless we can increase eligibility, we're going. We need to um, provide funding so that that capacity could be um, achieved, and more people could take advantage of the passes. Um, so anyway, it, it was a thought that um, funds could flow to help facilitate um, the uptake of the live passes. Okay. Any any further discussion or comments? All right, let's uh, let's keep moving. Oh, this is one I know something about. <laughs> Offer free RTD passing pa parking and transit. Parking is generally free anyway, but uh, parking and transit day pass benefits to anyone traveling on a COVID vaccination facility for a primary or secondary dose shot. Uh, so the idea of this is that. Uh, one of the things we don't want to do is we don't want to put drivers in the position where they are the enforcers. And so what what is suggested here is that a verbal I am scheduled for or I received a COVID vaccination today is, is sufficient to get past the driver. Now, if somebody's trying to cheat on that, it's also possible for some of the security people to say, can you show me your proof that you actually were getting a vaccination today? So there, there is some enforcement, but for the most part, it's an honor system. And surprisingly, you know, in, in some of the studies that have been done uh, by RTD on how many people are cheating on on tickets and things like that, really hasn't been massive numbers. And so uh, it, it seemed to make sense to kind of take a light touch on that part. But this is a day pass. Uh, there's The next one deals with something that's a little more extensive than that. But just getting, making sure we can get people there to get their vaccinations has a huge benefit for RTD, has a huge benefit for the community at large and the country as well. So any comments or, I don't, I hate to sound just like an advocate. I just don't see a lot of, a lot of negatives to this one. Anybody spot some, Lynn? Uh, you know, I'd probably defer to uh, Deborah Johnson on this one, I, and I'm not sure she's spent the time on it yet, but um, uh, 
I, I don't have a strong opinion. I mean, I think it's a, an interesting idea and whether it works for our drivers or not, I think would be the big question. Yeah. And that's why I basically lightened up the driver part. You know, I think that in the past, some of these cases where the drivers were, where the where the rules were complex, I had heard from some of the RTD folks that this really created a big problem for the driver. Any other comments? So I would just say, as we uh, spoke about this before, we are collaborating with you know the Colorado Department of Public Health and the environment and we're looking at a myriad of different things so this is in the vein of that and we've had discussions and we're leveraging some aspects since all of the focus has been on like drive-through clinics how do we get transit in the mix and we actually have a follow-up meeting tomorrow and we're sponsoring some events in which they're having uh currently uh transporting so yes in essence support this concept as we can work in tandem but really having delved into this specific one. Uh, and I wanna thank you in advance, or thank you in advance. Uh, thank you for providing this to me in advance of this because this was factored into the conversations which we're having, so thank you. Terrific, good. Okay, let's move on to seven. Um, the, the one thing I wanna say about seven is that, that it is intended to be a broad concept. And I fleshed out a bunch of details in, in here in writing this recommendation. How it's actually implemented, of course, is, is going to be something that RTD will have to, to uh, decide if they choose to pursue this. Uh, I tend to do that when I do research. It's like I, I got to have a straw man to really think through how this would work and what the pitfalls would be. And so um, I, I don't know that I want to read this whole thing. It's kind of it's kind of long. Uh, but the but the concept basically is I do I do want to make one motion and that is to change the the uh, title of this one uh, and we had we had talked about this uh, before if I could just find the page on which I've got this there we go what what it should read as is uh, <laughs> That's where I had it. Here we go. So uh, the title of it should be Implement an RTD Trial Ridership Program by Offering Temporary Free RTD Rail or Bus Service for Anyone Receiving a COVID Vaccination. So this isn't just a pass giveaway program. The idea is that it is a focus pass giveaway program for people who have been vaccinated. And, um, and in doing so, uh, we, are, we are also accessing some people for this that are uh, uh, already riders, but a great many of them are people that are not riders. And so, can we get some of those non-riders who might otherwise uh, consider uh, using transit onto our buses? And so, as a trial ridership program, uh, we could essentially do things like set up a, bo a booth, a table. At you know, when when you get a vaccination, you got to wait for 15 minutes before you're allowed to leave. And so, catching those people at that point and just providing them with a really simple card uh, with the expiration date and real big numbers, you could hold that up and the bus drivers could see whether it had expired or not. So there wouldn't be ambiguity on that side uh, very much. Uh, and it would be signed by the person at the booth and signed by the person that was actually using it. So it, it, it's, it's an easy way to do that. It expires clearly, so you know it's not like it's not like getting them a whole bus pass and it's cheaper if you're just basically have pre-printed these and you're signing off on them at that at that table so it's a chance for us to catch some people and get them to try rtd if they do this and they sign up for it and they never use it doesn't cost rtd anything or if they sign up for it and they use it occasionally uh, and they decide well you know i'd like to do this maybe three days a week or something then Maybe they get a regular pass or, or we recruit them on. And if they're people that already ride RTD, 
it's an incentive for them to get vaccinated and it's an incentive for everyone to get vaccinated. So this is like uh, a vaccination incentive program slash trial ridership uh, effort. So um, since I wrote this, I, I encourage all of you to ask me as tough of questions as you can come up with, but uh, feel free to comment on it, on it as well. Brad? Yes, Dan. Yeah. You know, I like this idea. Um, and, you know, simple is always, always better, it seems. Uh, it seems like there might be an opportunity here and, and kind of the wheels are spinning uh, in my head about whether or not we could do something like this at Rafta. But uh, it's always great to be able to also measure the effectiveness of whatever it is that, that you're trying to do. Uh, you know, for future purposes and for uh, similar kinds of programs in the future. And so while I like this, you know, having something that actually goes in the fare box or the, some way to record it, I believe uh, would have a couple of benefits. It would allow you to determine how effective your program has been in getting people to use the service. And it would also keep track of how many people, uh, different people have been vaccinated that are using your service. Mm -hmm. um, it might be too complicated mm -hmm. to implement in this case, but I throw that out there that having some way to kind of measure it might, might actually be good as long as it's easy for uh, the drivers to deal with and to administer. Mm -hmm. Yes, Elise? Um, you know, given all of the data that's showing up, showing, um, disparities in terms of vaccinations um, in communities of color, um, this might be a, a really helpful equity recommendation to try to address some of that disparity, um, particularly if you, uh, you know, concentrate some of the, the um, marketing around this um, in, in those communities. Um, so anyway, I, it does seem like if you could make it happen, it would be a dual purpose, purpose recommendation to both um, help out with ridership and further the state's goals to really um, promote vaccinations and would have the, the, the marketing benefit of the safest place you can be is on a bus because it's filled with vaccinated people. Right, and, and if you look at the people that are most transit dependent, uh, they're often minorities, and they're often living in uh, places where there may be crowding of people as well, and uh, families living in smaller quarters than they do in Cherry Creek or Cherry Hills. So, um, so that was part of the consideration. The other consideration I had in this was the idea of that second shot, because it's really important in the vaccinations that people come back for the second vaccination uh, to really get the maximum efficacy out of it. And giving them another 15 days of pass if they come back for the second shot, I think is, is something we don't know yet how difficult that's gonna be, but I'll bet with a lot of the folks that get the first shot, uh, getting them back for the second shot may be harder than, than we know right now. So that's another piece of it. Lynn, did you have something? Actually, I was just looking at it, but I was wondering, um, Rut, if uh, if one way to possibly simplify this would be not to have the if if we're you know if we're doing something and there are a lot of ifs here along the lines of your your number six where people can get a free ride to the vaccine, maybe we don't need to do. Two different one, two different passes, one after um, the first shot and one after the second. Maybe it's a a pass after you get your second shot would be enough incentive if they can already get there for free. I'm just thinking of you know how how it might be simplified a little bit, but I think it's a really interesting idea. Yeah, well, I tell you, in something like this, simplification is everything. If you, I can think of a dozen ways to ensure that they absolutely will do it and nobody cheats and all. That. You get through that, people, it just gets so complicated, it's too expensive. So simple is better. If simplify, I may. Simplify, simplify. Who was that? Thoreau. Deborah Johnson, if I may. Yes. 
Please. So having received this, I, I did explore the possibilities and this is something that I was really interested in and was wondering if there, and I approached this with our partners at the health department relative to when somebody establishes an appointment that they could get some kind of verification of um, verification of a vaccination appointment and we could use that so it minimizes all this past you know aspect so it's a collaborative effort and these are things that we're talking about there's a lot of nuances associated with this and i've heard you all speak about the marginalized communities and you know there are certain ways in which we could try to identify those and that's what we're working through right now because while it seems straightforward um we have to be a little more creative but i do uh, appreciate and support where this idea is going and, and just want you all to know that there's been some preliminary discussions around this about how we can simplify it. Thanks. Good. I'm all for that. Again, uh, the purpose of the RTD Accountability Committee is not to tell you how to run your business, it's to make suggestions and provide new ideas. So. We're from the accountability committee and we're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> Probably heard that one before. Okay, um, this is about partnerships, leveraging new partnerships. And um, but before we move on, I would, you, you know, I, I described a different change in the title. Uh, does anyone on the uh, committee have any objections to that change in the title? Or can we unanimously agree that it's okay to make that change? Ron, are we good with that? Do we need a motion or can we just take a unanimous consent? I think if the, As if the, the motion if maker, the, I consider it a friendly amendment. And so if my seconder agrees, um, that'll just be part of the main motion. And, and it looks like my seconder does. So I think okay. we're good to go. Good. In the interest of time, I'm happy to talk about partnerships. We, Please, we've do. This Please do. Be before. Um, about the idea of, of trying to find cost-effective ways to provide mobility, particularly in places that have experienced service cuts. And it's a way to um, do it cheaper and also to leverage local funds, um, either through communities or, or businesses. And um, the red writing that you see, the additions were courtesy of Lynn and Rebecca, um, because when when this was drafted, it was drafted with my brain, which was more Boulder County specific. There are examples <laughs> of creative, innovative partnerships across the the RTD district, and something that w we should continue to encourage. Very good, and and uh, it might be useful to have a friendly amendment uh, to make these changes as well. You want to move that, please. I I, Mr. Mr. Chair, I think that CDOT, I think Rebecca and CDOT had one other change that wasn't captured in this proposed amendment. If you'll give me a second just to oh, okay. yeah. oh yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't read it. Type that okay. in. I just wanted I wanted to make sure that I had right. that. I apologize. I thought I did. I thought maybe it was on the next page. So thanks, Ron. Oh, it, I, I, you're right. It did spill over, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Ah. Okay. Well, don't show them that part. That'll. that'll <laughs> that is the end. That is the end of the document. It just it's right. spilled over. Okay. So those are the those are the three proposed um, amendments. Great. That, and, I'm, that I'm aware of. And do we have any further uh, further discussion on this one? There is one other thing I want to mention, and that is I have a a longer version discussing some of the uh, uh, rationale behind the amendments uh, five and six, six and seven, six and seven. Anyway, um, the two that I worked on, I'd like to have this attached as an appendix to the recommendations, uh, just so that uh, some of the other information behind that, this is actually what I had sent to, to Deborah, uh, before uh, CEO Johnson, and I wanted to have it included as part of this whole package. So, uh, friendly amendment that this be uh, attached as an appendix in our recommendations. 
Sure, I think that's um, fine to have it as an appendix for more information. Okay. And I'm also fine with a, considering as a friendly amendment all of the uh, examples that we had just added in. That's all right with the seconder. We, we got it. Yep. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Uh, I think we are now uh, ready to vote. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that there is <clears throat> there is a really good uh, set of uh, equity assessment analysis uh, stuff uh, that Matthew put together on all of these. And that, of course, should also be an appendix to the uh, um, document included with that. I don't know if all of you have had a chance to read it. I read I read it twice, and I really uh, I do think it's well done. Of course, the criticism, the, the, the concerns he had with the stuff that I wrote gave me great concern. But <laughs> no, actually, it's just really well done start to finish, I think. Uh, anybody want to have any other comments on the uh, uh, equity assessment analysis? The only the only other one thing I noticed is that there's no real equity analysis on the first uh, recommendation that we had, uh, which is which is uh, it just seemed like a kind of an odd omission. But that's the one on um, basically this, uh, transparency, the transparency part. But I don't think it has to have it. But you know, it's overall, it's really, uh, I think, well done. And I appreciate your efforts in that, Matthew, as always. We ready to vote? Ron, are we ready to vote? Whenever you are, Mr. Chair. All right. All the uh, members in favor of these recommendations, would you please Signify by raising your right hand so I can see it. Looks good. That would be unanimous. Oh, Kristen's not here. So, uh, unanimous among the members present. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. Nice job. Good. We moved through this pretty Thank well. So at this point in our agenda, I think we're, uh, Ron, ready? Are we ready to go on to the RTD uh, fiscal policy statement? Are we, are we missing anything else? No, um, no, I think that's, uh, I think that's where we are. We, it uh, is, um, it is 1159, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we're yeah, out of time. time or thing. Um, are you okay with us uh, basically postponing this for our next meeting? Yes, sir. Uh, and that'll be fine. We can, and that'll give us a chance actually to wrap that into hopefully everyone. That'll give everyone time to really read the the financial, the RTD financial policy, and then we'll we'll be able as staff to kind of wrap that in with sort of the previous information we've provided the subcommittee on debt obligations. Um, we we're we we're doing some analysis of sort of. Uh, about the last four or five years worth of RTD budgets to sort of kind of ferret out some some trends um, to kind of put a whole sort of financial picture together as much as we can for the for the subcommittee to consider. But one other thing I want a couple of other things I wanted to mention on our um, uh, list of of uh, outstanding projects and goals and and things we need to do. Uh, one of them is the peer review of the RTD administrative overhead organizational efficiencies. And I know Highland was working on that, but can you, Ron, can you push them and see where they are on that and, and see if we can get them on uh, the agenda for our next meeting? Yes, sir. Present that. And uh, I, I also think we ought to take this, this uh, uh, outstanding goals and, and uh, what, what's it called? Work plan? Is that the terminology mm -hmm. that we're using? Sure. work plan and have that as the last topic on every one of our meetings so that everybody knows where we are in that and how we're moving along and how we're going to get done by may yes rebecca yeah mr chair to that point i wonder if you 
might be open as well as the rest of the group to making these these meetings just a wee bit longer. Um, I feel like uh, we always yeah. have so much to cover and we have a really busy few months ahead. So even another 15 minutes, um, ideally even maybe 90, uh, might help quite a bit. I, I am really all for that because we, we really do have a lot of work to get done and some of these issues are complicated issues. Do any of the members of the committee have a problem with that? Uh, how do you feel about it, Elise, Dan? Yeah, I, I really think we need that. Ron, is, what, what inconveniences does that create for you and Dr. Cog? We'll accommodate the subcommittee's desires. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's a big statement. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Yeah, I appreciate all you're doing here. Okay, with that, uh, I think we are ready to uh, sign off. Um, are there any other any other topics from any of the other members that would like to briefly discuss? All right, in that case, I, I call this the adjournment of the meeting. So we're done. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this and all the work you put into it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.